Okay, welcome to the forms training. I'm going to hit most of the forms that we um, see on a regular basis. Obviously, there are additional immigration forms out there that um, if you ever encounter in the future, if we start to do it more, I may do another um, presentation, but I'm gonna go over the most common ones today um, that we see over and over again in our firm. So to get started, I wanna go over the importance of your job. Your job is so important because you're providing the primary information, usually for USCIS, sometimes for the court, about the client's case. Accuracy is exceptionally important, uh, which is why your jobs are so very important. And I wanna tell you a little bit why. Um, because sometimes I know on these forms, it can seem like sort of a tedious, easy thing to do. Just get the information, put it in. Um, it's just everyday information, addresses, you know, um, employment. It's not that big of a deal, but it is a big deal. Um, and I don't say that to stress you out. I just tell you that, that your job is so important um, because you are really presenting the key facts of a client's case in a lot of cases. Um, and so here's why accuracy is really everything. First of all, because the forms are carefully reviewed, um, usually by USCIS, uh, sometimes by the immigration judge. And so if there's an error or an inconsistency, those can be seen by the person who's gonna make a decision about whether our clients um, deserve or even qualify for a kind of relief. Um, so when they're carefully reviewed, we want to make sure that everything is correct, everything makes sense, everything is truthful. Um, in addition to that, any forms um, that we submit can be compared against other records that the government might have. So if they have a record of the client entering the country at a certain time or leaving the country, being in immigration court previously, um, they may have a copy of those records and they're gonna compare our applications to make sure that the client was truthful about their history. And uh, form answers, usually will be discussed at a future interview. Sometimes there aren't interviews for certain kinds of cases, but a lot of cases have in-person interviews at USCIS and the officer will literally just take the form and go through it and ask the same questions again to make sure that the client um, understands them and is telling the truth. And in a court hearing, um, of course, the immigration judge has every right to go over the answers and question them. So that's why accuracy is everything. Um, but again, not saying that to stress you out, just telling you how important your jobs are. And I'm gonna give you the tools today to make sure that you're being as accurate as possible and helping the client um, give you the information that we all need as a team to be successful in their application. So first I wanna give you an overview of most of the kinds of forms you're going to see on a regular basis. First of all, the I-130. And the whole point of this is, <laughs> excuse me, I have a bit of a cough. The whole point of this is to prove a family relationship. We're not applying for status. We're not applying for um, a green card with this, although it may go along with the green card application. Um, the purpose of the I-130 is simply to prove that a legitimate family relationship exists, and then the client can use that family relationship to apply for status. So there are two parties in an I-130, the petitioner, which is the family member with status, and the beneficiary, who is the immigrant, our client, who we're representing to try to get legal status. So I have um, here, as requested, um, kind of the general kinds of information that's going to be requested on these forms. So from the petitioner, just sort, sort of general name, date of birth, etc. Um, biographic information, address history, employment history, family information, legal status. The beneficiary has a little bit less um, questions um, regarding those um, categories. So some general information, current address and employment, um, a little bit of information about their last entry and their family. There's a form called the I-130A, which is for spouses only. You're not going to use that for um, a, you know, a mother petitioning for a child, a child petitioning for a parent. Um, that's for a spouse petitioning for another spouse. Um, one of the most common types of forms that we are going to go 
through um, and that we're going to prepare is the I-485, which is proving that the applicant is eligible and deserving of a green card or permanent residency status. Um, so this is a pretty in-depth form. I think it's about 20 pages. You're going to get general information, family information, address history, employment history, immigration history, criminal history, biographic information, and a whole host of questions about inadmissibility, which we're going to talk about in depth. The I-765 is to request a work permit. It's not a very involved form, unlike the I-485. Um, it's gonna get just general information about the applicant's name, date of birth, place of birth, um, their legal status, what type of case um, we're basing this application on, and whether they've had previous authorization, and whether they want a social security card um, if it's not their first time, or if it is their first time. The I-864 is the purpose is to prove that somebody is going to financially support the immigrant so that they're not a burden on the government. The government's really worried about that. So we have to provide this I-864 with um, a lot of adjustment of status, um, a lot of the I-485s. So it's mostly about the sponsor, the person who is saying, I'm going to make sure this person has what they need financially um, so that they don't have to be a burden on the government. So mostly about their income, taxes, and employment. So you can have an application packet that has all of these forms, the I-130, potentially the I-130A, I-485, I-765, I-864, this could all be together. Um, at the same time, there are cases in which we just do an I-130, and then we'll do a waiver, which we're about to talk about, and then we'll do the I-485 with the I-765, um, which is why I'm not giving you like a list of each type of packet and which forms to do because each case is a little bit different and has different needs. Um, and you will pick that up as you go along and you can get that information from the person assigning you the case. But to continue with the kinds of forms, the I-944 is this new form that's come up in the last year or so to prove that, again that the applicant won't be a burden to the government. This is that public charge form. So this is going to go in depth with the applicant the, the intending immigrant, general information, of course, but in, in information about their income, taxes, any assets they have, benefits, any debts or liabilities, education, skills, again, to prove that they're not going to become financially dependent on the government. There's some question about whether this will continue to be necessary in the future in the Biden administration, uh, but we'll get to that if things change. These are the waiver forms, I-601, I-601A, I-212. And these are to prove that the applicant deserves a waiver or a pardon for some form of inadmissibility. Inadmissibility is something that makes you ineligible to adjust your status because of uh, criminal history or because um, you have been here unlawfully, you entered without permission and you've been in the US without um, permission for a while. Um, you may have left the country without, um, you know, after some time here um, that was unlawful or without permission. Um, these are the kinds of things that require a waiver. There are also more sticky situations, perhaps involving fraud, but again, um, that will be specific to the case you're working on. Um, generally, when we're doing an I-601A, it's because of unlawful presence. And so what the form asks is kind of general information, case type, like what kind of case are we basing this off of? Often an I-130. <laughs> um, it may ask about any qualifying relatives and the extreme hardship that will be suffered um, if the applicant is not pardoned if their inadmissibility isn't waived and they are not allowed to immigrate to the U.S. And then the I-918 and the I-918A um, is to prove that the applicant qualifies for a U visa, which is a type of visa for victims of crime who comply and help law enforcement investigate and or prosecute um, that crime that was committed against them. It's only certain qualifying crimes um, but it can be a good option for people who don't have an, any other way to, to lawfully immigrate. 
Um, so the information that's requested on this form and the I-918 is for the principal applicant who is actually the, the victim. The I-918A is for any derivatives, which is to say family members such as a spouse or minor children. Um, so the information requested was going to be sort of generally about the applicant, immigration history, criminal history, there's some inadmissibility questions, um, questions about family. The I-192 is also a waiver, um, similar to the ones listed above. Um, it typically goes with the U visa application. It can also go with the T visa application, which we don't do very much of, so I'm not really talking about today, but they are both victim visas. Um, so this is sort of similar um, in that it requests general information, family, addresses, employment. Um, it's not as much based on hardship, although you certainly do have to approve hardship, but the, the I-918 um, accompanied by an I-192 waiver can forgive more, at least immigration violations than some of the other waivers above. And it's the job of the attorney to determine which waivers are required in any case based on the legal facts of a client's case. So you should be told which waiver goes um, with the case you're preparing, but just to explain some of these things to you so that you have a better understanding. Um, and then there's the I-360, which I know a lot of you have been doing a lot of lately. This is for special immigrant status, and it has, it encompasses a lot of different kinds of status. We primarily focus on two, VAWA, um, and SIJ, which is, which is Special Immigrant and Juvenile. And for anyone who doesn't know, VAWA is Violence Against Women Act, which is inaccurate. It doesn't have to be physical violence and it doesn't have to be against women, but essentially um, sort of a, a domestic abuse form of status based on um, a, an LPR, permanent resident or um, US citizen who um, has been abusive to the applicant and, and uh, so the applicant is trying to get status, but obviously struggling. So the kind of information, this form is actually, it's pretty long because it involves a lot of different kinds of status, uh, but it's not very in depth. Um, it kind of just asks for general information, some immigration history, at least your most recent entry, some about family, and if it's based on a VAWA, a little information about the qualifying abuser. The I-131 is a re is to request advanced permission to return to the US after a brief, um, a brief travel outside of the country. Um, so it's a pretty short um, form and it can go along with the I-485. And the point of this is because if you've applied for a form of status, but then you leave the country without notifying the government um, while your application is pending, your application can be deemed abandoned. It can be denied. Um, you should not leave the country without getting advanced permission to do so and to return because once you leave, can be very impossible to get back in. So that's the point of the I-131 is to say I have, um, you know, some kind of family emergency or I have aging relatives, I have children in my home country, um, I may need to go back and be with them in, in an emergency if they are sick, if, if a family member is dying. Um, and so we go ahead and request permission for them to leave the country and re-enter while their application is pending in case their application isn't adjudicated by the time they need to leave the country. The I-821D is for DACA applicants, both first-time applicants and uh, renewal applicants. And the point is to prove that the applicant um, qualifies for that DACA status. Um, so it asks general, you know, information about the applicant, immigration history, criminal history, and uh, address history. And you've got to play close attention to the DACA form because certain um, sections are for um, everyone to fill out while some of them are only for initial um, applicants to fill out. And so renewals don't have to fill out that application, that part of the application again. So it's important to read that carefully. The I-751 is a request to remove the conditions on permanent residency. So for people who get permanent residency through marriage to a US citizen, but haven't been married that long, they can be granted a green card or permanent residency, but it's limited and it has conditions on it. And the point of this is to make sure that people aren't just 
getting married for green card purposes. And as soon as they get that green card, they're out of there getting a divorce, moving on with their life. Um, so this is two years down the road after they get their uh, permanent residency and they have to apply to remove the conditions to allow them to become a full fledged green card holder. Um, and they either can apply with their spouse if they're still together or they have to show why they're not still together with their spouse and it was still a good faith marriage. Um, but for whatever reason, the marriage fell apart. And then the N-400 is to apply for citizenship. Um, so at this point, the client has already been through many of these kinds of forms. They have already gotten their green card status. They've been um, a permanent resident for the amount of time required, and they are applying to become a naturalized citizen. So uh, the information that's going to be asked is um, general about their family, about their addresses, biographic information, uh, where they've been employed, um, any travel outside of the United States while they've been a permanent resident. <laughs> <laughs> and then legal eligibility, um, whether they've committed any crimes, violated any laws that would keep them from becoming a um, naturalized citizen. So that's an overview of the forms um, that we often encounter. The other ones would be those um, with the immigration court, EOIR forms. I'm not going to cover those today. Um, they are sort of a different a different kind of animal, uh, I will do a separate training to talk about particularly 42A and 42B cancellation of removal applications. Um, many of these same principles we talk about today will still apply, but the forms are a little different and they're specifically for immigration court. So we'll deal with that in a separate training. All right, we're going to jump straight into common issues questions that I had when I was doing forms for the first time and that I hear from people a lot, um, particularly um, related to addresses and employment history. Most of these forms, many of the forms ask um, not only your current address and employment, but for the last five years as well. Um, so I want to reiterate the importance of being accurate here. Uh, don't just guess a specific date. Uh, don't just say, if the client says, oh, well, I started that job um, in 2015. Don't just say January 15th of 2015. Don't guess it. Let's be honest. Um, and it's okay if you don't know a specific date. Um, in fact, it's better to not put that if you don't know it. So for example, if someone says, I came to the US sometime in 1998, but I really don't know when. Uh, it's been a long time. I've had a lot of kids since then, you know. Um, you can put 1998 and just leave that. And that's better than saying a specific date because if that client gets um, interviewed or they're in a court hearing in the future and somebody asks, when did you enter the U.S.? And uh, they don't say January of 1998. It could be considered an inconsistency. So let's be honest, if we don't know when it was, we'll put 1998. And if we're, we're not sure, we think it was March, let's say, it was like March of 1998, but it could have been February or April. We're not really sure. You can add this little, um, I don't know what it's called, wave symbol that means approximately. So I could say approximately March of 20 of 1998. Um, and that would indicate that that's an estimate. Um, we think that's when it was, but we're not saying for sure it was. So if you're unsure, you can always um, do that or you could just put March 1998 or in the example here, March 2005. Having said that, make sure that you get appropriate estimates. So if you're getting someone's address history and they say, oh, I moved to my new house um, last year in 2020. 2020 or approximately 2020 is very vague for a very recent occurrence. Surely they know when they moved. If Even if not the date, at least the month. It wasn't that long ago. They should have paperwork. They should be able to find something um, that says when they moved. So just putting 2020 would just, that would be too vague. It would be kind of lazy. I mean, the client is being maybe a little bit, um, I know it's a lot of work to go back and look through your um, documents to find out exactly when you left, but they shouldn't be too hard to find if it was that recent. Go ahead and ask the client, please find something a little more specific. On the other hand, if the client says, you know, I think I entered the US, it was 
it was winter, I think it was 2001, but I'm not really sure. It's understandable that we're putting an estimate there. It's been a long time since then, a full 20 years. Um, so just make sure that your estimates, um, first of all, are accurate and um, are appropriate to the time period. Um, and then when it comes to information, especially for people who are not English speakers or, or not native English speakers, sometimes they don't get the full name of their address or of their company, correct? They remember part of it, um, they, you know, or I mean in Tulsa, so we'll just say 21st Street. Everyone knows what 21st Street is. Technically the address is going to be some numbers East 21st Street, but they may not say East because we just don't. We all know what we're talking about. Um, so what I do when I see an address, especially from the Tulsa area, because we have a lot of these east, west, north, um, south, you know, <laughs> excuse me, we have a lot of these words, we can have these long addresses. Um, I go ahead and Google the information they, they gave me, the address, and make sure that I've got the full correct address. So they may say, oh, 1124 21st Street. And then I'll Google it and find out, oh, it's 1124 East 21st Street. And I also double check the zip code um, to make sure that the zip code is right. And you can simply Google addresses and um, with the city and they should be able to pull up the address. Now, if you Google an address and Google is like, I don't know what that is, you know, there are no real matches. Maybe that's something to follow up with the client and say, are you sure that's the address? Can you give me more of a hint of where that would be um, to make sure that it's correct? Um, sometimes you may Google an address and uh, you see it's an apartment building or a um, uh, like a trailer park, but they haven't given you a unit number. Um, Clearly there needs to be a unit number there. This happens to me occasionally. Once I look up an address to verify it, I realize, oh, this is an apartment, uh, but they didn't tell me what apartment it is. So now you know to go back and follow up and say, oh, um, I, I see that your, your address is an apartment building, right? Could you just give me that unit number? And they'll be, oh yeah, well, it's 105. And then you can add that. Um, it's just an extra step. It's a quick Google search um, just to verify accuracy. Um, and I think it's smart to do, especially if you look at something and it doesn't look quite right. I'm gonna go ahead and admit Lorena here. Okay. Um, similarly, when we're talking about a client's employment, they may be, they may have worked at a chain. McDonald's, Wendy's, Quick Trip. And so you ask them, okay, where, well, when did you work? Um, when, you know, where did you work? And they'll say, oh, I worked at the McDonald's in Tulsa. Well, we all know there's more than one McDonald's in Tulsa. So what, and they're not going to know the address and that's okay. All you need to ask is, oh, well, where was it? And they could say, oh, it was the one um, at 21st and Garnett. And then you can search McDonald's 21st and Garnett in Tulsa and find which one they're talking about and just pull the information um, from there. So you, they don't have to go do that on their own. That's a quick Google search that we can um, that we can do and find out if we just ask the right information from them to figure out where exactly it was they worked. Um, similarly, a lot of, again, non-native English speakers um, may generally know the name of the company where they worked, um, especially if it's maybe a smaller local place, they may refer to it as, um, you know, they may not know the spelling, which is okay. They may not um, know the full name of the company. There may be an abbreviated version that they always say. So when I get a company's name, if I'm not familiar with it, if it's not McDonald's, Quick Trip, El Tequila, whatever, uh, I'll go ahead and Google it. Um, to verify the um, address and verify the name of the company. Often it's something really similar, but they didn't quite say it the right way or they weren't sure how to spell it. You can get so much information from Google. And so I really recommend to use it to double check information um, to help out our clients who again, may not be native English speakers, um, may be recent arrivals to the US and are still learning their way around town. Um, we can help them put the correct information by doing a quick search online to verify what they're saying and make sure that's what they're talking about. This is one that comes up a lot in my experience. There is some confusion about what is work. 
we have to put people's employment history on a whole lot of forms. And understandably, our clients are um, hesitant to talk about working because they know they didn't have authorization to do it. Um, so they will say things like, oh, well, I mean, I haven't worked. Uh, I was just paid in cash at this one place, but it wasn't like work. That is work. If you, Even if you're getting paid under the table and not paying taxes and the employer's not reporting you as an employee, if you're just getting paid in cash for jobs that you're doing, that is work. We do need to um, report it on the form. Uh, somebody will also say, oh, well, I don't, I don't work. I don't work for anybody else. I, I kind of have my own, you know, I work for myself, but I don't work for other people. Again, being self-employed is still work. That's still something we need to report. Um, and then people will say things like, well, I just clean houses for my cousin and she pays me. Uh, I just watch my friend's kids three times a week and uh, she gives me cash for that. Again, that's work. We need to be honest and report all of it. And the important thing here is most clients have worked unlawfully in the US. Um, if we're applying for status, if they didn't come here on a work visa or something like that, they probably have worked illegally and that's okay. Most of these cases are not gonna be affected by people um, working unlawfully. Most of our clients have, how else would they support themselves and feed their children, right? Um, so now if you're working on a different kind of case where it is an issue, um, hopefully the attorney or whoever's assigning you the case may discuss that, but they should have already gone over that in the consultation with the client um, if that's going to be an issue. Typically it's not. Go ahead and encourage clients to be honest with you about any kind of work they did for, you know, even if it was for cash, that's still work. Let's just be honest about it. Get it out there. Most of the time, not an issue, not even considered, not discussed, okay? Um, another common issue is there's not enough space on the form. My client has seven children and there's only a place for four children. Um, so there are two options here. You can use the final page of the form. Most forms, the last page is just open space um, for additional information that the rest of the form didn't make space for. Or if you have got a lot of things that you need to provide explanations for or have a lot of additional family members, addresses, uh, work history, you may just create a whole new document um, in Word and call it um, an addendum to whatever form it is and put all of that information in the form. You can do either of those things, whichever is the most organized. Um, don't just leave out the info just because there's not space. Don't just say, well, uh, we'll only list the first four kids. Um, add the information either on the final page or an addendum to include along with the form. The importance of instructions. There are a couple of different kinds of instructions you really need to pay attention to and will really make your job easier. First, the instructions on the form itself. The forms often have instructions right before the question or before a series of questions at the beginning of a heading or a group of question types. Um, there will often be a little paragraph saying, here's what we need. Um, if you answer yes to these, please provide an explanation. Um, so read those instructions, read all of the form that you're actually working on because the answer to the question you're looking for may just be in some parentheses right there in front of you on the form and you don't have to go anywhere else to find that answer. It's right there. Um, then again, you may have a more detailed question that the USCIS instructions online um, are going to answer. Uh, and I will show you that here in a minute when we get out of the PowerPoint presentation. But again, a simple Google search, I-485 instructions, and it's going to take you to the USCIS website and you can click on the instructions link. And there's a nice long um, set of instructions created by USCIS to help people fill out the forms accurately. This is always your starting point. If you have a question about how to answer the questions on the form, look at the form, see if the form itself tells you how to do it. If not, go to the USCIS instructions and see um, there are specific instructions within those um, documents that say, um, you know, question one, answer like this, question two, answer like this. Um, and so, or, you know, the form, the form instructions will say, oh, you're eligible to do this if. 
So those are the starting places. Read the instructions on the form and on the official instruction sheet by USCIS because they are actually pretty helpful. I, as an attorney, go straight to the USCIS instructions when I have a question about what to put in a form, how to answer a form. Now let's delve into some of the common legal questions. Um, so this is, I know uh, you guys didn't go to law school and these questions can just kind of be mind boggling to try to figure out. Uh, I'm gonna try to help you out here. The first thing is start with the consultation notes. Um, Lorena, usually Lorena is going to be the one who did the consultation, um, and she already had to vet the clients for these kinds of legal questions in the consultation most of the time. So the answer to your question, what you're trying to figure out, may already be in the consultation notes, and likely is. But to go over some of the specifics so that you understand it a little better, let's talk about entries. Our clients either entered lawfully or unlawfully. Um, so if you see the, the acronym EWI, e that means entry without inspection. A lot of our clients will have come that way. And it just simply means an illegal entry. They were not inspected by a border patrol officer. They were not given permission to enter. Usually this will have happened outside of a checkpoint, um, outside of a port of entry. They crossed the border somewhere where there were not any officials um, and they didn't have a, a visa. They didn't have, they may not have even had a passport. They didn't have any permission to enter the U.S. Um, they just entered unlawfully. That's EWI. Um, now, if they crossed at a point of entry with permission, then they were inspected and admitted. And this, um, this can include wave throughs at some point in the past. Um, at points of entry that people may have just been waved through by the officials who didn't want to deal with like a really um, in-depth look at all of their documents and their car was waved through the checkpoint in Mexico or whatever. Um, well, that's a lawful entry. Um, they were permitted to enter the United States. Um, so that is, those are kind of the two entries. But again, you're going to see um, in Lorena's notes, often you'll see how they entered and often it's gonna be EWI. Um, now on the other side, we have clients who have entered or tried to enter and then been returned to Mexico. Um, so again, we're gonna start with the consultation notes. This can be confusing. And if you have a question, you can always come to an attorney or an assistant to try to figure this out. Uh, there are some different kinds of returns um, that people may have had. So if they just crossed the border, they were caught by border patrol within a few miles of the border the same day they were held for just a few hours and then just sent back to Mexico. Often that's going to be a voluntary return. Typically that's for Mexicans or claimed Mexicans. So a lot of our clients will have said, oh yeah, I'm from Mexico. Um, so that they were just put back across the border to Mexico. Most returns at the border before 19, April of 1997 uh, will be voluntary returns. So, um, and a voluntary return is, a, it's different than a voluntary departure. I know that's, that sounds crazy. It's different. It's not like a voluntary departure. It's not like a deportation. It's a really minimal thing. And it usually doesn't bar you from any relief. Um, those are usually kind of the best kind of returns. The best way to go back is a simple voluntary return pretty quickly at the border after a few hours. Now, a voluntary departure or salida voluntaria in Spanish um, is granted as an alternative to deportation or removal. It can be given by an immigration judge or by ICE. Um, often, you know, you can ask, so you can ask the, the client, well, did you ever go to court? Did you ever see an immigration judge? Did you even have, what about video court? You know, did you see a judge over, over video when you were in detention or something? Um, people often recognize the phrase salida voluntaria and um, will say it if that's what they think they, they got. Now a removal or a deportation is it's the biggest deal, right? That's, um, that's kind of the the worst case of being returned, but it's not always the end of the case. We can, in some cases, do a waiver or a pardon for that. Um, this can happen, there can be an expedited removal at the border. Um, usually there is some kind of paperwork that a client had to, or at least was asked to sign. 
Um, they're often told that they can't come back for five years. Those are signs that um, it may have been a deportation or removal. Um, if they had already been in the US for some time, typically it's gonna be ordered by an immigration judge. Um, so you can ask again, did they, did they go to court? Did they see an immigration judge, um, et cetera. Again, look at the consultation notes. Lorena or whoever did the consultation should have um, already talked to the client about these things to get the information. But here are some pointers for you to try to at least ways to start asking the client about their experience to try to figure out what happened at the border, how they came in, how they left, um, and, and therefore, you know, how their case proceeds. Okay, now we're about to get into the big stuff, the inadmissibility. Okay, so most of these questions are gonna be on the I-485, but also the I-918 and the supplement A for the nine I the I-918 are gonna ask some of these questions as well as the I-192. Again, we're gonna start with the consultation notes. Um, the person who gave the consultation should have vetted a lot of these general issues, whether the applicant has criminal history, um, whether, you know, whatever their immigration history might be, <laughs> a lot of that will already be in the consultation notes. Having said that, you as the forms person have a responsibility to go through those questions and make sure they're answered the cor correctly. I know that um, there are a lot of them. There are maybe like 60 or 80 of those questions on the I-485 and it's really complicated legal terminology and it's sort of overwhelming. So we're gonna go through that kind of question by question um, and try to show you what it really means in plain English um, and what kinds of cases will have a yes or no answer. A couple of really important points on this. You need to read every word of the question especially those little conjunctions like and, or, but. Because if the question asks, were you granted voluntary departure and failed to leave in the specified time, if the person was granted voluntary departure, but they left at the right time, you answer no to that question because it, it has an and in it and it requires both having a voluntary departure and failing to leave. So it's really important to read. A lot of these questions are um, two or three parts. They have several different um, factors in them that you have to consider. And if all of them aren't met, then you don't answer yes. So it's really important to read them really carefully. Um, the other important point on these questions is most of them, if you mark yes, are going to require an explanation on that last page or the addendum and it may be as simple as yes i worked on i worked without permission to support myself and feed my family not really a big deal you just have to provide an explanation some of them are going to be more in depth like yes i uh, was arrested for this drug charge it was in Oktaha in 2011 and um, the charges against me were dismissed so, um, you know, obviously read the question and then um, if an explanation is required, make sure you go ahead and get into that with the client and ask them the background details so that you can answer correctly. So I am going to get out of here and share a different screen. Let's see. I'm going to share my I-485. Uh, I see a question. Is it the same with inadmissibility on the I-601? Okay, um, let's go through the I-485 questions and then I will get to that question or if it's covered by the ones in the I-485, it may go ahead and answer your question, okay? Let's see. Okay. Form I-485. We're gonna start here with question 14. Have you ever been in this, well, before that, this is what I'm talking about here at the top under part eight, answer these questions. If you answer yes to any questions um, or you answer no, but you're unsure of your answer, provide an explanation in part 14 additional information. 
Um, this is what I'm talking about, those instructions that are already right on the form in front of you. So moving right along to question 14. Have you ever been denied admission to the United States? This means that you tried to be admitted to the US, but they said no. So if you cross the, you, if you cross the border, like you cross the river, um, you didn't run into any officials, you didn't ask for permission, you've not been denied admission because you didn't even ask, right? Um, now, if you go to a point of entry and say, I wanna enter the US and they say, no, you cannot come in. That's a denial of admission. Number 15, have you ever been denied a visa? So again, did you apply for like a tourist visa, um, maybe at a consulate abroad, and they said no? If so, then you've been denied a visa. But you had to have actually applied or tried to apply. Um, 16, have you ever worked in the US without authorization? The answer to this in most cases for many of our clients is going to be yes. And again, that's OK. We're going to put our little explanation at the end that says, yes, I work to support myself and provide, you know, food and housing for my children. That's about as in-depth as you need to go. That's okay. 17, have you ever violated the terms or conditions of your non-immigrant status? The key here is this phrase, non-immigrant status. So that's going to be like a B visa, a visitor visa, or maybe if you came on some kind of work visa. Now, if they violated the conditions, so if they worked while they had a visitor visa, that would be a violation because you're not allowed to work and earn money in the US on a visitor visa. A lot of our clients are not going to have ever had any kind of status. So they couldn't have violated any terms or conditions. They didn't have any status. Question 18. Elisa, yes, just a quick ahead. question, just to clarify. If the client entered without without being inspected mm -hmm. and they work in the United States, then the question number 17, it's going to be a no? Right, because they didn't have okay. any non-immigrant status. They had no status at all. There were no... Okay. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 18, Have you? are you presently, which is now, are you now or have you ever been previously in removal, exclusion, rescission, or deportation proceedings? So if they have been ever issued a notice to appear by ICE, they've ever gone to court, um, they've ever had, even if they didn't go to court, maybe if they knew about court that they were supposed to go to or it got moved, then they are likely in proceedings. Again, this is a question that's most likely going to be answered in the consultation notes. Um, but this is this is specifically immigration court. Have you been put into immigration court now or in, or in the past? Question 19. Have you ever been issued a final order of exclusion, deportation, or removal? Which means, you know, so if you're still in immigration court right now, you probably don't have a final order. A final order is at the end when the judge says, okay, I'm denying relief. I order you deported to Guatemala or whatever. Um, so again, this should be in the consultation notes, um, but it's, it's a final order at the end of proceedings that typically that the immigration judge um, says, I order you removed. Um, okay, question 20. This is one we have to read carefully. Have you ever had a prior final order of, you know, deportation or removal reinstated? Okay, to put this in plain English, let's say somebody was deported previously. They went to the immigration judge, they were deported. And then they came back into the United States without permission. And they were caught at the border. And, um, you know, the agents at the border were like, oh, you've already been deported before. We're going to take that old order of deportation and apply it to you now because you re-entered without um, permission and we're going to deport you again. Okay. So they had a prior final order and now it's being used again because they likely re-entered the country. That's going to be a more rare situation and again should be in the consultation notes. Um, okay, question 21. Have you ever held lawful permanent resident status, which was later rescinded? This is going to be rare. This is if somebody was a green card holder before something happened and the green card status was taken away from them. Their permanent residency was taken away for whatever reason. That's going to be more of a rare thing. Um, 
Okay, 22, have you ever been granted, this is that one I was talking about, have you ever been granted voluntary departure by an immigration officer or an immigration judge? So that can be ICE or the immigration judge, but we see this big but here, failed to depart within the allotted time. So if somebody was granted voluntary departure and they left on time, the answer to this question is no, because they, they did not fail to depart within the allotted time. Question 23, have you ever applied for any kind of relief or protection from removal? So this is if somebody was previously um, or, or is now in deportation proceedings, in removal proceedings, they were in court and they submitted an application, like an application for asylum or an application for um, cancellation of removal. If they ever applied, you would mark yes. So again, um, look at the consultation notes. If it shows that somebody had previously been in removal proceedings, had been to immigration court, maybe had um, a voluntary departure or a removal, you may ask them, did you apply for anything? Did you submit any applications? If they said, oh, I applied for asylum, um, then you would have to mark yes on this. But make sure that they actually applied and submitted that application and didn't just say, yes, I, I'd like to apply for asylum because just saying that in court is not sufficient to apply. Again, some of these get a little, it's a little complex, it's very legal. You can always ask an attorney if you're trying to figure these out and you're not sure. Okay, um, 24A is very specific. It's only for people who have been a J non-immigrant exchange visitor. I don't know that we've ever had a client who was a J non-immigrant visitor. It's a, it's a specific kind of visa for exchange students and it requires that they go back home for two years before they come back to the US. This is usually gonna be no. I don't know that I've ever actually seen this via yet. And actually, I, I, I used to have that visa when I oh. studied in the United States like four yeah. years ago. <laughs> okay, so you know what it's like and you know about the two year um, residence requirement. Yes. Yes. So, so you should be very able to recognize if somebody was a J um, exchange visitor. But again, I haven't seen it among our clients. It's it's going to be more rare in, in our situation. Okay, we're going to scooch on over to criminal acts and violation. I know this brings up a lot of questions, so we're going to go through it. Remember, read this paragraph here. Um, you're going to have to provide an explanation. Um, and this also says, um, this gives you a hint on how to answer. Even if your records were sealed or cleared, or even if anyone said you no longer have a record, you still have to answer yes, okay? Um, and then you have to explain any yeses. Okay, so let's jump into 25. Have you ever been arrested, cited, charged, or detained for any reason by any law enforcement official, which includes immigration, the armed forces, so I don't know, somebody in the military, uh, somebody from the army or the Coast Guard. This is often gonna be a yes. Cited includes traffic citations or traffic tickets. Usually traffic tickets aren't gonna be a big deal. They're not even really gonna be considered. We've all been pulled over for speeding, like, you know, it's happened to all of us, essentially. Um, but you have to mark yes here, even if it was just a citation for speeding five miles an hour over the speed limit. The answer is yes. And then, of course, if you've been arrested, even if you weren't convicted, if you were charged, even if you weren't convicted, or if immigration detained you at the border, even if it was just for two hours, the answer to 25 is yes. Some clients will be no, they really have been, you know, kept their nose clean. They've never been stopped, cited, arrested, detained by anyone. That may be true. A lot of cases it's gonna be yes. And you can mark yes without like being like, oh my gosh, the client's case is, it's over. They don't have a chance. That's a, no, like even if they've been arrested or detained by immigration or they've got some traffic tickets, typically that's gonna be okay. Um, because again, Lorena or whoever did the consultation asked them about their criminal history and um, if, if their criminal history would bar them from this application, we wouldn't be doing the application. Uh, having said that, I'm going to point out a few questions down the line that if, if a client answers yes to, you should tell an attorney 
because uh, it can be bad news. Um, but mostly, I mean, if they were stopped by immigration, if they got some traffic tickets, mark, yes, it's fine. Just explain it. It's not the end of the world. Okay, moving on to 26. Have you ever committed a crime of any kind? Even if you weren't arrested, cited. This is a really tricky one, okay? I know it is. There are a lot of kind of concerns and questions about this. Obviously, well, you know what, Lorena, do you want to chime in on this, on what our official stance on how to answer this question is? Because I know it's a little bit tricky. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can do that, sure can. So everybody has probably committed a crime that they have not been arrested. I sped to the office this morning. Well, I did not today because I got driven. But anyways, we all do things. But our clients, one, for us to be able, for them to be able to say they committed a crime, they almost would have to be attorneys themselves to know they actually have broken a crime and what crime it is and whether it is a crime and you have to have an intent. So it, it there could be so much more to it then um, than we need to be putting onto them because they have to have the intent of committing a crime. But like I said, if you actually pose that question to the client, they might say, yes, well, I guess, yes, I, I came here illegally or, hey, yeah, I sped or I'm working with a fake social security number, something like that. They may say those things, which may or may not be crimes because they don't know the crimes. They just hear these things. So with, so because of that, let's not even, my thing is, we answer that question based on my legal expertise. And the question is, no, the only crimes that we're gonna know that they committed are the ones they tell me about. And those are the only crimes they committed and those are the only ones that we're gonna talk about. So this answer is always no. Because what, about, it just what about if they, they were arrested, charged and convicted of a crime? Are we going to mark this yes? So if they ever been, no, it's still no. Just because somebody has alleged that you committed these crimes and you were charged with this, um, it's still no, because you could be innocent. And so you may have not committed the crime, which is probably happens quite often. <laughs> no. The, a guilty plea? A guilty plea is yes. Okay. No, wait a minute. A guilty plea is, have you, ever, have you ever committed a crime? Yes. Yep. That one's yes. If they have pled guilty to something, if they have said they're guilty to something, if they ever paid a ticket, if they ever did any community service or did probation uh, or deferred sentence or suspended sentence, that's pleading guilty and that's admitting that you committed a crime. So we put yes on that. All right, thank you. Any questions on that? I know that's a tricky one. All right, 27. What we were just talking about, have you ever pled guilty or been convicted? Um, so this is actually a little trickier than it sounds. Some people know, oh yeah, me uh, declare culpable. Some people say, uh, well, no, but I mean like, I did some community service and I paid some fines. If they are doing something that is like some kind of punishment or involves a fine, they likely uh, have some kind of conviction, may have pled guilty. Um, that's going to require more looking into. Now, if that's the case, then the evidence specialist on this case should also, at the same time that you're working on the forms, be getting copies of the actual court records because they're going to be requested. Um, and then you can look at those court records, look at the arrest records or the, the case um, summary and get your answer. So on this one, if you're really not sure, you can wait a little bit on the evidence specialist to obtain the records that we're going to have to include. And then you can refer to the records to see um, what actually happened here. And again, you can talk to an attorney if you need help reading the records and you're not sure what they mean. Alyssa? Yeah. Is it this, um, so let's say they got a ticket and, for speeding and they pay off a ticket, yeah. would that be like a yes because they're pleading guilty to that ticket and they paid it off? Would yeah. that still be a yes? Yes, I always mark yes to that, which again, that's not really gonna affect anybody if you're if you're like, well, yes, I, I, um, was, I was cited for speeding and I paid my ticket. Or even, um, yes, I have three traffic tickets. I have a speeding ticket in 2005 and a no driver's license in 2007. And then in 2018, I have a speeding. That's okay. Like you're not gonna be denied status because of those minor traffic tickets. Um, and yeah, so, so you can mark yes. 
and, and simply say, yes, this is what happened. This is where it happened. And uh, I paid my fines. Yeah, end of story. But yes, that would be a, a guilty plea. Even though it's a, something so minor, it's still a criminal offense. Um, so go ahead and mark it as yes. Can I, can I, I just want to clarify on 26. Um, I understand, I think, but I just want to play it back and see if it's correct. The only time we're ever going to say yes on 26 is if someone has been convicted of a crime. Is this right? Is that what I understand? Because what Lorena was explaining in a second ago, it's sort of like, well, they might think they've committed a crime, but until there's actually a conviction, a guilty plea or a guilty verdict, we're going to answer no there. Is that my understanding of what Lorena was saying? That's what I said. Yeah, I think awesome. that's right. Thank, thank guilty you. Or they found guilty of something. Even, well, yeah, yeah. Guilty, stuck, convicted of something, then there's, there's no yes there. It's always no. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So moving down to 28, have you ever been ordered punished or had conditions imposed on you that restrained your liberty? This includes a suspended sentence or parole or an alternative sentence or a rehabilitation program. Um, so ask the client what, you know, what happened? Were you on, were you, did you have parole? Did you, did the judge order you to go to rehab for your drug offense? Um, were you on probation? Um, did you have to go do community service? So you have all of these examples right in front of you that you can present to the client to find out whether um, the answer to this is yes. Question 29. Have you ever been a defendant or the accused in a criminal proceeding? Again, including deferred prosecution. I know this is getting into some details of the American criminal justice system that some of you may not really be familiar with. That's okay. If you're not sure about it, you can ask an attorney. Um, but I mean, obviously, if you have been, if you have marked yes to these above, often 29 is going to be a yes. Um, question 30, have you, and this is one where I think if, if you do not get the yes answer from the consultation notes and you find out about it when you're talking to the client, you should talk to an attorney and just let them know. Have you ever violated any controlled substance law of a state or the United States or a foreign country? So essentially this is a drug question. So if someone's like, oh yeah, you know, like I, uh, I actually, um, I've been selling marijuana for some time now. <laughs> Talk to an attorney about that. Um, that's, that could be a, a problematic question. All right, let's move down to 31. Um, and this is sort of just math. Have you ever been convicted of two or more offenses for which the combined sentences to confinement, jail, prison, for five years or more. But again, hopefully an, uh, the attorney has already caught this. If this is an issue, um, this is likely not gonna be an issue because if it is, we have already discussed the inadmissibility problem. Um, but if you, I mean, again, if you have any questions on this or it seems like it might be a yes answer, talk to an attorney just to make sure. A lot of these questions now are a little clearer. They're wordy, but it's clear what they're asking. Have you ever illegally trafficked drugs? Uh, have you conspired or helped with the trafficking of drugs? Did your spouse or your mom or dad traffic drugs? Um, did you come to engage in prostitution? I mean, I haven't seen a yes on this. I hope we don't, but it can happen. Um, <laughs> have you ever received money because you were a prostitute? So most of these, I'm not gonna go over these um, question by question because um, they're, they're wordy, but more or less, it's kind of clear what they're asking about. Um, and the answer is almost always going to be no with these. Um, you know, this is, this is like human trafficking, mistreatment of others, drug trafficking, being a prostitute. This is what we're asking here. Let's move to security and related. Uh, again, well, there's some of these are, <laughs> are you a spy, you know? Um, are you trying to violate any um, export laws? Most of these are just not going to be an issue with our clients. Um, you can ask them, but they're not, they're usually not going to be an issue. Um, 
again, engage in any unlawful activity. We're not going on a fishing trip here. We're not asking them. We're not trying to ask them about any criminal intent they have or have ever had. If they're, you know, <laughs> don't go on a fishing expedition for, for bad information. This is asking uh, about, um, you know, violating the law, becoming a spy, violating export laws, um, overthrowing the US government. Um, I guess if we have anyone from the January 6th riots, we might have to talk about that, but <laughs> um, typically these aren't gonna be an issue. Um, and even if somebody had this sort of intent, I doubt they would tell you. Um, okay, so more of this, we've got hijacking, sabotage, kidnapping, political assassination. If somebody answers yes to this, talk to an attorney. I haven't seen it happen. Um, okay, but having said that, 49 here, have you ever received any type of military, paramilitary, or weapons training? Some of our clients will answer yes to this. Um, I have had a couple of clients who were actually part of the Mexican um, army. They may have been just like reserve and they did, you know, a year of training or a few months of training and that was it. Um, but sometimes that is actually, um, that, that this is actually a yes. Um, so you may pay more attention to this. Um, so again, we have, has your- Elijah? Oh, sorry, Elisa? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, so um, one client, he brought in his military reserve card, uh -huh. that, like an ID. Right. But, and I talked to him and he said that he never had any training, but it was on reserve just in case he okay. was needed. Okay. So, so right there, I had to put no, right? Right. Right. That's really good. So yeah, just saying, oh, I was in the military would not be sufficient. Um, in the US, typically, if you were ever in the military, you've had weapons training. That's not a question. In other countries, it may not be the same. Um, but so yeah, good. Good job, Stephania. Um, but that's to say that people, our clients may have military experience. So be careful about the questions, read them through um, and ask, you know, what was your what was your involvement in the military? What did you actually do? Did you have any training? They may not have. Um, okay, so we're gonna kind of skip through some of these again. Um, again, you know, selling weapons. Uh, Fifty three is actually another good one. Um, have you ever worked? for a prison, a jail, a prison camp, a detention facility. I have also had clients who did, maybe as an interpreter um, or in the capacity of, you know, and maybe an administrative capacity, but I have actually had clients who um, have worked at a jail or a detention facility. So um, this one may be a yes. And it did not, it did not pre prevent them from um, getting status. Um, obviously, if somebody's like, yeah, I was in the military and I went to war and um, I was on active duty and I killed people, let's talk to an attorney about that. Um, but a lot of this is just going to be kind of administrative, reserve um, kind of stuff. But if it seems out of the ordinary, talk to an attorney about it. Okay. Um, Again, a lot of this is about weapons, military, the Communist Party, I haven't really seen that, a Nazi, specifically during the um, period of 1933 to 1945. I don't really think we're going to see a lot of that. That would be a very, very old client in Germany. Um, these are very clear, right? Acts involving torture, killing, severely injuring, rape, um, persecution based on religion. Child soldiers, these are pretty straightforward. Okay, public charge. Are you exempt from the public charge ground of inadmissibility? So that's that form I-944. Um, and a lot of just adjustment of status based on an I-130 or based on having a family member um, who's petitioning for you, um, you're not gonna be exempt. Um, we're gonna have to go ahead and do that I-944. Um, but a lot of what we're doing is VAWA, and VAWA are exempt um, from that public charge ground. The weird thing is, so you have all of these boxes. Um, of, I'm exempt. Um, well, so you mark down here, I am exempt from this form. Okay. 
And then there's this other form that we talked about, I-864, which is the sponsor's affidavit saying somebody is going to uh, financially support you um, to make sure you're not a burden to the government again. Um, and then you mark why you're exempt if you're exempt, which they don't actually have boxes for everything, which is kind of confusing. Um, but it's the case. So you just read through these boxes. Um, a lot of you have been already doing this and I think you, you have it. If you have questions, you can chime in, but um, I'll just read through. They're pretty straightforward based on what we're, what we're applying for. Okay, so then we're gonna jump down here. We've got some more of these. We're moving into immigration questions now. 63A, have you ever failed or refused to attend or remain in attendance any removal proceeding filed against you after this date, 1997. Um, so again, just being in immigration court isn't enough. You had to have been in immigration proceedings and then not gone to your court hearing for whatever reason. Um, hopefully, if that's the case, this will have been in the, um, the consultation notes. It's not usually going to be the case in most of these forms, but um, it might be. Look at the consultation notes. Um, and then 63 B and C have to do with that and explaining what happened there. Okay, so here are some red flags questions that if you don't get the answer from the consultation notes um, and the client just reveals this to you while you're asking questions, uh, best to talk to an attorney um, and make sure that an attorney knows and that we don't need to um, do a waiver that we're not already doing, better to be safe. 64, have you submitted fraudulent or counterfeit documentation to obtain any immigration benefit? which includes a visa or entry to the US. So if you um, presented a fake green card at the border to let you in, uh, this is a yes and it could be problematic. So definitely talk to an attorney about that. Similarly, 65, have you lied, concealed, misrepresented on an application or a petition to obtain a visa or other documents required for entry into the US admission or any kind of immigration benefit? Essentially, have you lied to immigration in order to get some kind of status? Again, uh, if you did not get this information from the uh, consultation notes, talk to an attorney. And the big one, 66, have you ever falsely claimed to be a US citizen? Huge red flag. If the answer is yes, we need to talk about it. That can be just, that can, that can end the case. So again, if you're not getting this from the attorney, if you're getting this from the client, stop, talk to an attorney, let them deal with this. Make sure they know about it if it's not in the consultation notes. Um, okay, 68, go ahead Austin. Oh, thank you. Um, could you please give us some examples when we we need to place a yes in that question, for example, when they enter with someone else's visa or what other cases could be. Which any of these questions or one of them in particular? Oh, uh, 66. 66. Oh, that's you know what? That's a good question. A green card is not the same thing as claiming to be a U.S. citizen. It's totally different. So this, the answer to this is usually no. Most people know not to claim to be a US citizen. It, it does happen sometimes. Um, but so presenting somebody else's green card is not a claim to US citizenship. Saying that you, you're a permanent resident is not a claim to citizenship. You would literally have had to present a false passport that shows you to be a, um, a citizen of the United States or you would have had to say, yes, I'm a citizen. And on those points, I just want to bring up a point real quick. Um, you know, so many times children, mm, I'm not going to say so many times, I'm going to strike that. Sometimes children are brought over as uh, U.S. citizens or they're, they're told to say they're a U.S. citizen to come into the United States. Um, many times kids don't know this though. So I would say take them for their word. Don't go extra digging if you don't have to. Um, when we for sure have to say yes is when we know for sure that they claim to be it, like they were caught with a false birth certificate at the frontera or a U.S. passport. Um, but if they just say, and, and I will try, I will try to ask this to the point where I don't need you guys to ask me more questions. Um, if they told me they entered illegally, that's all I'm going to keep it. 
when I'm not going to ask more like, oh, what do you mean illegally? Like you use false papers? No, I'm not going to go on a digging expedition. If they weren't caught, it's not my job to do what uh, USCIS's job is. I'm not going to offer up information that might perjudicar or bother my, uh, my client if they don't know for sure. Um, so, and then just by using a fake social security number as well, that's not claiming to be a US citizen as well. Or just because they use somebody else's um, ID documents to be, that doesn't mean they're claiming to be a US citizen because this person could have been just a legal permanent resident or could have been who knows what. These could have been fake names, fake numbers. So we don't attribute to them that they claim to be a US citizen that is a very last conclusion we have. So if you if they say, yes, I claim to be a US citizen, then for sure, I mean, if you can note that down, but I will definitely, that means one of us attorneys will be doing more questioning with this person to make sure they don't, they really did or not. But again, okay. if it says no, move on, move on. Don't, don't go digging more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, none of this is to say like, try to find a yes answer. I'm just giving you all of this information so you understand what these questions are asking. Um, do your due diligence, but we're not we're not going on fishing expeditions. Um, okay, sixty eight is another important one. This is about alien smuggling, which is to say, and this is a pretty broad question: Have you ever knowingly encouraged, induced, assisted, abetted, or aided, which are fancy words? Have you helped somebody who didn't have status? come to the US illegally. So if somebody, if a mom comes and brings her two kids who also don't have status across the border, that's considered alien smuggling. I think of smuggling as like hiding somebody in a car and then like getting through the checkpoint and like, you know, but that's not it, it's a much bigger thing. So, and usually where we, where we see this a lot is in like U visa applications, this question is specifically on the um, waiver, the, or I think it's actually on the I-918 um, about alien smuggling. And, and you may see that your, your client, yeah, they brought their kids over um, or they sent money to help their kids. Um, typically, if, if the answer to this is yes, um, there's gonna be a waiver required, um, but that's what this question means. Helping somebody, come across the border illegally, enter the United States um, illegally. And it's usually to do with like children, bringing your children or helping your children to get here. Um, okay, well, let's- Alyssa? Yeah. Is it also with the spouse since the I-485 kind of goes with the I-130? Sometimes the husband pays money to bring the wife here illegally. Yes. Is that a yes for that too? Yes, that's also a yes. Okay. But remember, I mean, read it carefully. Have you ever knowingly done this thing? So if you sent money to a spouse and they were like, hey, hon, I need, I need this amount of money. And you're like, oh, okay, here you go. And then they show up and they're like, oh, I use it for a coyote. That would not be knowingly. I don't see that happen very often, but that wouldn't be knowing. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, as an example, read every, read every word. Okay. Um, now, these are some of those important questions where, again, read every word because a lot of these are two-part questions. Have you ever been excluded, deported, removed, or have you ever departed on your own, even if you've been ordered removed? So, so if you were deported or the immigration judge said, uh, I order you deported to Honduras, and you're like, okay, but they don't deport you right then, but then you leave on your own after having that final order, then the answer to this is yes. Again, a lot of these you're going to already see um, the information on the consultation. Um, okay, that, and um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, and voluntary departure is included in, in this question or not? Question, no. Have okay. you ever been excluded, deported, or removed? Those are what we call terms of art. They're very mm -hmm. specific legal words that have specific definitions and a voluntary departure is not uh, an exclusion, a deportation or a removal. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. All right, 71 is gonna be yes for a lot of people. Have you ever entered the US without being inspected and admitted or paroled? So for anybody who crossed the border illegally, crossed the river, crossed in the desert and they didn't have any permission, the answer is yes. 
Um, and then since April 1st, 1997, we're getting farther and farther away from this date. So we see less and less of the entries, but we still have people who entered before here. So if, if it's an, an entry in the 90s or even earlier, remember to check this date um, because some of the law doesn't go into effect until April 1st, 1997. So have you been unlawfully present, which means here without permission, without any kind of status, for more than 180 days, but less than a year, and then departed the United States? So if you've never departed the United States after being here for this amount of time, the answer is no. Similarly with this one, for, were you here unlawfully for, more, for a year or more, and then departed the United States. If you didn't depart, the answer is no, even if you were here for a year or more, okay? And this is a good right. number. You were unlawfully present if you entered the US without being inspected, of course, or if you legally entered, but you stayed longer than permitted. So you came on a visitor visa and you found somebody and you fell in love and got married and you just stayed here um, and then your visa expired and then you were here for six months let's say um, before your after your visa expired um, so then we're looking at oh yeah you've been here for more than six months 180 days and it was unlawful because you overstayed your visa even though you came legally be sure to read these notes they can be really helpful can i add one thing yeah. to um, and then I think too, when you're asking the client about that, um, it's important to ask about how old they were to whenever they didn't have status, right? Because it, it, they have to be 18 or older in order to accrue unlawful presence, right? So if they were a minor under 18, then we're not counting that time as far as I understand. Except for the permanent bar. Oh, okay. But this, so, is, this is sort of getting into attorney reasoning so yeah, okay yeah i, I don't no, want to stop right, right here. Right. okay no that's a really good point that is good um but again this should have been um addressed by by the attorney in the consultation because this gets into whether they're barred from even applying or being being admitted to the u.s because not barred from applying uh, barred from being admitted to the u.s because of the amount of time that they've been here unlawfully and because they left or they left and came back um but this is a pretty deep legal issue that the attorney should have noticed that there's an issue, but you may find that I have had consultations where I talk to the client. They're like, oh yeah, I just came this one time uh, and that's it. And then when they get to the farms people and the farms people are like, well, they actually have um, two entries. They actually came several years before. And it's like, well, that changes the case. So sometimes you guys will find things that the attorneys didn't. So, um, you know, we appreciate you taking time to do this and uh, ask the right questions. Um, but again, so I guess similarly, if you're not getting this information from the consultation notes and it looks different than what they told the person in the consultation, like it seems like they didn't say everything in the consultation or they're changing what, th what they're saying, um, it's best to just talk to an attorney about that. Let them know, let's, let's look at it again and make sure they aren't misunderstanding something or maybe they misunderstood before and now um, they're telling us what actually happened. Okay, moving down to 73 A and B. Okay, now here, we gotta read this right here. This is the really important part at the top, have you ever re-entered or attempted to re-enter after having been unlawfully present for these periods of time? Um, so you had to have tried to or actually re-entered um, after these things actually happened. So again, we're just reading very carefully here. Um, and again, deported, excluded, removed. That doesn't include voluntary departure. Those are different words. Miscellaneous conduct, we kind of have, you know. <laughs> Do you plan to practice polygamy? Half of our clients don't even know what that is. Um, and then when I tell them, they get really embarrassed. <laughs> um, so, I mean, are you accompanying somebody who has a, um, you, know, it's, it's, you know, who's inadmissible? This is almost always gonna be no, I haven't seen this. Um, did you withhold custody of a US citizen child? Outside the US, I haven't really seen this. Um, 
Oh, here's another good one. 77, have you ever voted in violation of um, any of these provisions or statutes? Uh, if the answer is yes, and it was not in the consultation notes, talk to an attorney. We're gonna have to do, uh, we're, we're gonna have to talk to the client more and find out what happened. Um, it may not, even if they voted, it may not have been in violation of a statute, um, but more legal work is going to have to be done there. So tell an attorney if this is yes, and you did not see a yes in the um, consultation notes. Have you ever renounced citizenship to avoid being taxed? That seems like really extreme. Um, I don't know how much taxes you would have to owe to do that. I've never seen it. I don't, I don't know. Um, similar questions here. Um, most of our clients can't even be part of the US Armed Forces uh, because of their status or they're, they're rejected even when they apply. Um, so a lot of this is not even going to apply, but these are you know, questions about the military. Um, and training. And then, yeah, so that really goes over those hard questions on the I-485. Any other questions about this? We're, we're going to pretty much um, end it here because um, I know that was a lot to go over. And those are, I think, the key issues of confusion and concern and questions um, when filling out these forms. But if you have more questions about these about this form, about the questions we went over, or something I didn't get to, you go ahead and jump in now. I think there was a question. Maybe you said this and maybe I tuned out. You mentioned, I think, voluntary returns, voluntary departures. Did you go over the difference between that being an order of removal? Uh, I, I guess I talked about that they are different, but not what, like, what it really means that they're different. Um, so I can do that or you can do that, but yeah, I mean, so they are different. So there's some questions on there. Have you ever been removed or deported from the United or ex expulsado expulsion from the United States? If they just have a voluntary return or voluntary departure, that's a no, they haven't been removed. So that those are different. Um, you will see in my notes, a VR means a voluntary return, a VD means a voluntary departure. And then, uh, I will put you know, order removal or ordered removed or deported such dates. So clearly that'll help you trigger this information. Um, voluntary returns, voluntary departures are a lot less significant than uh, removal orders, especially they will not trigger the bars um, necessarily. Them themselves won't trigger the bars, the reentry bars from that. Um, but I think that was a question that Dulce wanted to clarification. She said that it'd be great to know a little bit more details about that. So I wanted to make sure that Dulce, um, that information was clear. So when she's completing those forms, she knows how to answer those. Yes, great, thank you. So Dulce, I don't know, did that clear up any of these forms going over? Did that clear up that question you had about it? Yes. I never got to ask, and I think you're, this is hopefully a yes. You are recording this, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. That's why I look nice today. <laughs> <laughs> look lovely and it's a great background there. So yes. yes. We're recording for anyone to come back. And I, like I said, I'll send out my um, PowerPoint that I was on earlier. Um, so you can refer to it if it's helpful to you. Yeah, it is helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions about these forms, like I said, I'm going to do another training specifically about EOIR forms for cancellation of removal. And I'll also do asylum at that training as well, because uh, that, I mean, whew, those are some forms that dig really deep. Uh, they can get a little complicated and are often going to the immigration court. Um, so I'm going to do a separate training about that. I haven't forgotten about those forms. You guys will probably not be dealing with those forms quite as much, but you may someday and anyone who's watching this in the future may. So uh, I'll do a separate training on that. Okay. Any other questions? No, I don't have more questions, thank you. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and end recording and uh, thank you guys. I know we're a little bit late uh, in the day, but thank you guys for jumping in on this.